when I was in college, the CC's buffet was $2.99. And the Poncho's Buffet was $3.99. And man, we would hold out just about every other week, we would go to either CC's or Poncho's. And we would absolutely throw down. I mean, there was times at CC's that me and my buddies, we would spend three hours consistently eating pizza. I mean, they had a big screen TV. You could watch football. You could eat pizza. You could watch football. You could just keep eating pizza. <laughs> Ponchos, brilliant. <laughs> Not very good, <laughs> but brilliant. Raise the flag. We double dared each other one day. Who could raise the flag the most? There was a dude with us who raised it 15 times. Man, we loved it, and we consistently would go to CC's and Poncho's with absolutely no self-control whatsoever. And there was consequences to that. <laughs> this morning we're going to talk about self-control, and listen, uh, not having self-control at CC's and Poncho's has very little consequence in comparison to not having self-control in other areas of your life. And this morning, as we talk about Samson Delilah and how he lacked self-control and what that looks like and who really controls oneself, there's some important things for us to understand, for us to walk faithfully, for us to walk holy. And for us to walk with self-control. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16 uh, may be a a fairly familiar passage to you. Samson and Delilah says, Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. The Gazites were told Samson has come here and they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and he pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. So this dude was strong, right? We know that. Verse 4, After this he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that, he, that we may bind him to humble him and we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. You would think, you would think that Samson, Samson would be like, I, I don't know that we need to hang out much longer. <laughs> Samson said to her, it's hard to say Samson without a P. Forgive me. Samson said to her, I, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, they have not been dried. Then I shall become weak and be like all other men. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in the inner chamber, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire, so the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pen, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web, and she made them tight with the pen and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pen, the loom, and the web. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? 
You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in her hands, and she made him sleep on her knees. Hello. And she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them, and they made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zor and Eshtael in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel for 20 years. Man, what an incredible story. Well, you may remember that uh, when Samson was born, uh, God had uh, talked to his mother about this Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite vow was a pretty typical vow that many people would take in order to hear from God. But this was a vow that God uh, had laid on him for his entire life because there was a mission that God wanted him uh, to complete. And this vow included avoiding strong drink or alcohol, not cutting your hair, and avoiding dead bodies, which were considered unclean. Essentially, it was to stay away from things that were unwise, unclean, and unnecessary. But what we see, <clears throat> excuse me, that what we see is the more God blessed Samson, giving him strength to fight his foes, the more Samson grew confident in his own ability. He came to a place where he felt invulnerable. And the more he engaged, as a result of that, the more he engaged in irresponsible behavior. In other words, Samson's heart used God's blessings as a reason to forget God. See, in grace, God takes our weaknesses, he takes our failures, and he uses them. But in our sin, we take his gifts and his strength, and we use them against God. <clears throat> You know, I think what we see in Samson is similar to what we see in a lot of people who are very successful. And oftentimes, those who are most successful are, are also the furthest away from God. I mean, Samson thought he was immune and invincible to all. He, he had avoided so many close calls, and he attributed all of those avoidances to his own strength. He thought he was smart, savvy, sexy, self-sufficient, <clears throat> Delilah, on the other hand, was motivated by fortune and fame. We see in verse 5 where the Philistines come to her and they say, hey, we got 1,100 pieces of silver for you. And she's thinking, okay, I can compromise this guy, not a problem for greed and for gain. I mean, she knows that if she takes out this uh, uh, Samson, who is the Philistines' greatest enemy of her generation, she would be a national hero. And can you, I mean, can you think about the potential of wealth and influence that she could have then? 
But you may also be asking yourself, I mean, why, why did Samson continue to go back to Delilah over and over, knowing that all she wanted to do was to harm him? Why did, why did Delilah continue to go back to Samson even though he continuously lied to her? <clears throat> well, there was a codependency happening between them. Both of them were living in denial of the addiction that they both had, an addiction that stemmed from a place of idolatry. And so they came to a place in a position where they needed one another to fulfill their misplaced needs. So essentially, addictions are a result of idols they've, that, that, that we make, Samson Delilah made. And when we have those idols in our life, we have to feed those idols in order to appease those idols. You see, for Samson, he needed Delilah's sexual favors and adoration to feed his idol of sex and power. So he pursued pleasure over his purpose. You know, keep in mind, guys, that Satan will always take our greatest pleasure, whether good or bad, and he will exploit it to sabotage us. Yeah. Delilah, on the other hand, she gladly put up with Samson lie, Samson's lies in order to feed her idol of fame and fortune. She sought prosperity over true relationships with people. But they had both become blinded to their condition. And this is true of any of us who find ourselves tethered to an addiction that results from some type of personal idol. As we attempt to meet our needs of acceptance, intimacy, approval, and security in anything other than God, we will compromise ourselves. Here's what we see. As we've been talking about the book of Judges, we see this cycle on a consistent basis where God's people make a commitment, then they begin to walk in complacency like Samson did here, and then they eventually compromise See, Samson and Delilah were simply using one another to feed their idolatry, to feed their addiction rather than serving one another. Certainly they may have said, maybe we've said this at points, I'm with you because I love you, but what we really mean is I am with you because you are useful to me. Listen, any relationship, friendship, romance that is born from a place of self-enhancement, self-satisfaction, rather than service is always doomed to fail. And these two people gravitated toward one because they were needy. They were in spiritual poverty. So they were looking for one another to rescue themselves out of their situation rather than looking to the one who created them. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, need love. Need love cries from our poverty but gift love longs to serve. Need love says to a woman, I cannot live without her, but gift love longs to give her happiness. You cannot love a fellow creature fully till you love God. <clears throat> I mean, Lewis is essentially saying that unless you're experiencing the, and living in the fullness of God's love to fulfill your deepest needs, you will always have the tendency to use people to bolster and satisfy your own personal needs. I love how the psalmist talks about this in Psalm 84. This is such a beautiful picture of deep satisfaction in the Lord. He, he says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways of Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, the valley of Baca is this desolate place when we're in those places of indecision. It says as they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. I mean, isn't that like God to take something desolate and, des de uh, and like a desert and bring springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. <laughs> Love that. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. 
Man, I love how the psalmist is expressing how God's love is so engulfing that his deepest needs are filled with God alone. He's saying, listen, you don't need a child to fill these needs. You don't need a new job to fill these needs. You don't need a lover to fill these needs. What you need is the intimacy that only God provides in a relationship with him. <laughs> well, Delilah, Delilah gets to Samson. We know that. Exactly what she wanted, so she thought. And, and, and he'd been slowly breaking this Nazarite vow over a period of time. We, you may remember that he had touched the dead carcass of a lion that he had split open, which is pretty awesome that he split open a lion, but he shouldn't have been touching the carcass, right? And eating the honey, that's kind of disgusting. And then he was, we, we find him in chapter 14, verse 10, at a drinking party. He's not supposed to be having any strong drink. And now we see that he has shaved his head. And the Spirit of God has departed from him. You know, I think Samson just assumed that he would just pop back up and have his strength back like he used to. Uh, understand this, that God never blesses us when we are in outright rebellion or disobedience. He may use it for his own glory and for his own means, but he will not bless you in the midst of it. Samson was so oblivious to his condition that even after he told Delilah the truth, he takes a nap in her lap. <laughs> you know, I think he believed in his own power, his own self-control. You see, his self-deception was not just a psychological one, but a theological one. And this is important for us to remember. If we're only trying to deal with addictions or idolatry or a lack of self-control from a psychological or intellectual or even a disciplinary standpoint, we will never get the complete freedom that God gives us. At, at, at a max, we will trade one addiction or one idol for another. But unless if we look at it, and I'm not, I, I'm not discounting the psychological, I'm not discounting that at all, but what I'm saying is that all problems are also theological. They have to do with our relationship with God. You can't fix a spiritual problem with external measures only. And that's what Samson was attempting to do, and he was out of control as he was attempting to do it. I, I love what Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. And here lies Samson. He only saw things from an external standpoint. He was unable to see how dependent he was on the grace of God. He thought that his strength was, was an absolute right that he deserved rather than a gift that he was given. Yeah. Oh, how critical a thing this is for us to understand that, that we all have a heart like Samson's with a propensity to drift away from God. Our nature, a divided one, will still drift. And we have to recognize the drift and direct it back to the king. And listen, this is where the gospel work of grace comes in and God's church, his community, that we recognize that apart from the power of Jesus, we can't fully find wholeness in our own strength. Now, it's also true that we need gospel community. We need the church. I love what Tim Keller says. There is no divine power without discipleship. And listen, discipleship happens within the context of the body of Christ, within the context of the church. So we're talking about self-control this morning. Because there was a lack thereof in Samson's life. He continued to sabotage himself. Without self-control, you self-destruct. Without self-control, you self-destruct. And, and, and the same problems we see in the text with Samson are exactly the same problems that we see with those of us who lack self-control today. Listen, he had a disproportionate view on his ability to make decisions. He thought that every decision he made was a good one, and so he perpetually made bad decisions, right? Right? He was putting himself in bad situations. Listen, if you lack the ability to control your spending, you're going to find yourself in debt. 
He overestimated his willpower, assuming, and we do this too, we assume that our will alone can bring us out of trouble sometimes. He was playing with fire until he got burned. Well, he, he and Delilah both easily manipulated. You see, people who have self-control master their moods. They restrain their reactions. They temper their tongue. They manage their money. They stick to their schedule. They hold their health. I want us to look at how Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about this. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 7 now. Romans chapter 7 and and how Paul dealt with self-control. Let's talk about that for a second, just self-control in general. Because, you know, when we think about the concept of self-control, it implies a battle between a divided self. But I think we also have the tendency to think of self-control from the standpoint of discipline, willpower, uh, self-restraint. We talk about it in terms of our ability to control something or an authoritative position that we have over our behavior. The scripture talks about it completely different. And, and, and scripture doesn't talk about it in terms of us mastering something, but rather being mastered by something. Rather than being strong in self, scripture implies that something is strong in us. And I ain't talking about the force. And Paul understood that self-control wasn't about his ability to be strong, but about the Holy Spirit's ability. And this is so critical because there's such a, such a difference between worldly self-control and godly self-control. Uh, because Ultimately, it determines who gets the glory. If we exercise self-control out of our own strength, we will be tempted to take the glory and, and, and think that we did this. But if by faith in Christ superior power and pleasure, he will get the glory. Amen. Well, look at what Romans 7, verse 13. We're going to read a little bit in Romans. What a great passage, man. It's so good. Verse 13. So he, he's talking about how he, he relates to the law of God and sin and grace, okay? So we pick up, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, <clears throat> sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. Uh, now, this next verse If you can identify, I totally identify with this, verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Oh, so important. We'll come back to that. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So, I mean, I can totally identify with that emotionally, intellectually, behaviorally. And here we have the Apostle Paul who is struggling in the same way. Been those moments in your life where you go, I can't believe I did that. How could I possibly have the capacity to say something like that or do something like that? Well, here's the good news in chapter 8. So let's keep reading. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
For the law of the Spirit, you guys are a little lively this morning. That's good. That's good. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now listen, the, it talks about the Spirit 11 times in 11 verses in, in the beginning of chapter 8. Okay, so check this out. Okay, so verse 3, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. You remember back in chapter 7, he says, this, I, I, I want to do something, but I do not have the ability. Good news here. Okay. By sending his own son, here's the gospel, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of law might be filled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind to the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, talking to the church here, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, Remember that promise that Paul makes in Ephesians chapter uh, 1, that those who are in Christ, the Spirit is sealed in you. Amen. You, how, uh, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Man, that's good stuff. We could just have, it, we could just have an invitation right now. I mean, that's, that's so good. A couple things this morning about self-control, all right? And when you look back at verse, or chapter 7, verse 22, where, where Paul says this, he says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Listen, the word of God ought to dwell in your life consistently. Amen. You've got to spend time in the word of God on a daily basis. Self-control is informed by sound doctrine. It is informed by the word of God. Disciples go to the word of God because it is the foundation. It is the plumb line for what is right in character, in emotions, and intellect. We don't have any business trying to control jack squat if we aren't being informed by the word of God. Jack squat. Listen, Scripture must be our starting point. I love how Paul in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, he says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. I believe, I hope, I pray that whoever is in this pulpit is constantly doing that because that has to be our plumb line. But listen, you need to be a learner at the feet of Jesus with his Scripture on a daily basis consistently. Well, we were, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were down in Houston, Galveston area, and we went to NASA for a day, which is really cool. NASA is um, awesome. They need to call Disney World and have them come and kind of redo some things. Um, but, I mean, think about it. I mean, that is nuts that people are in space. And they got this SpaceX thing. We were checking out SpaceX. They, they weren't taking reservations yet, but it, it, it takes you to the space station like people like us. Well, maybe not people like us. People maybe with larger uh, uh, bill folds than me uh, can go, but they can go hang out in the space station. But think, but think about that. I mean, the first, Alan Shepard, the first American who went into space, crazy. Like, what are you thinking? Man, this is going to be fun. It's like a roller coaster. Like when you're in space, what if you press the wrong button? I mean, it's crazy to think that we have people in space. Well, we, we spent uh, the day there. We got to uh, learn a little bit about what it's like in a space station and on a spaceship and all that cool stuff that you see on Star Wars. And uh, it, one of the really cool things that we learned was about gravity-free environments. So when you're in a gravity-free environment, your muscles contract. 
So this is kind of weird. I've never noticed this, but now I'm looking. That an astronaut who's in a gravity-free environment, his head swells and the rest of his body shrinks. His muscles shrink. His bones shrink. So in order for him to, when he gets back to earth, not to just fall down because his, his muscles can't uh, support his weight, because that's what happens when you're there over a period of time, he has to work out, they have to, he or she have to work out at least two hours a day with weights, running, bike, I mean, they're running in place, but bike, but they have to work out two hours a day for seven days a week. Every, every single day consistently to keep their muscles from atrophy. Pretty cool though, huh? Listen, the same is true though with the word of God. God gave us his word to prevent spiritual atrophy. We have to spend time in the word of God every single day or you will experience spiritual atrophy in your life. I can assure you that if there is not consistent word being implanted into your heart, you are living a life of spiritual nakedness. And if you assume that you will have the ability to be under the control of the Spirit of God and yet not have the Word of God in your heart, in your mind, in your emotions, you are lying to yourself. And just like the astronaut who steps out after not having worked out on a consistent basis, your spiritual muscles will just fall down and you will not have the ability. Like Samson, you will not have the ability to live with self-control. Second thing is this. Self-control is a work of grace. Self-control is a work of grace. This is so critical for us to understand. Listen, we are set free by the grace of God. Those first five verses of chapter eight do such a marvelous job of, of, of giving us this picture. We are set free by the grace of God. And listen, grace is, is not just this thing where God's hugging us in the, our sinful state and overlooking our sin. That's not what grace is. Or the grace is God who lifts us out of our circumstances of our sin and changes our situation and changes our relationship with him. Grace is a result of Jesus making the sacrificial payment on our behalf because our sin separates us from God. Grace allows us to experience that power in the embodiment of the Holy Spirit. It's grace that brings us back to the truth of the gospel. That is not what we do for him, but what he has done for us. See, it's grace that reminds us that we are not in a position or an authoritative place of power to save ourselves from ourself. I love Paul in Ephesians 2. He says this, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's great news. So that in the coming ages he might show immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Remember this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As in self-control must be a work of grace. It, it stems from that. But listen, grace also informs our freedom. Grace informs our freedom. You know, a lot of us think that if we're, we're being controlled by the Spirit, we don't have freedom. And the reality is, is we have more freedom. Yeah. But we have, to have, we have to let grace inform that for us. You know, I think for a lot of us, we stay, we stay in a state of captivity because we don't understand that condemnation doesn't apply to us. 
Remember what 8, 1 and 2 said? It said, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And that's great news for those of us who are struggling with sin in our life, which is all of us. But for many of us, we, we are saved, but we are not free. It's because we have not allowed the work of grace to be a part of self-control. I love how Paul talks about it in Romans 6. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer are enslaved to sin. So when Jesus, uh, when he died on the cross and he saved us and he gave us his righteousness, he replaced our sin. He input into those who believe him because we've been accepted by him. He, when, when, when we believe him, he has imputed, is the word there, his righteousness in us. He killed sin. That's not all. <laughs> For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Yeah. That's good. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become servants of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So it's not baseless for us to live under the power of the Holy Spirit and with self-control. There is fruit involved in that. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, when we recognize that self-control is a work of grace, then we will begin to walk in the freedom that he desired and designed for us to walk in. Third thing is this. I just said third thing is this. That's good. Self-control is empowered by the Spirit. Self-control is empowered by the Spirit. There is a difference in embodying self-control and controlling yourself. We talked a little bit about that a second ago. You know, we typically think of self-control as this author uh, uh, authoritative position that we have personally. But willpower and discipline is a good thing, but apart from the Holy Spirit, it doesn't yield eternal fruit. In fact, I would say that discipline and willpower can be very dangerous if that's all we're applying to certain things. One, it breeds pride. We'll attribute glory to ourselves for the accomplishments that we see around us. It, it gives us a false sense of security. But self-control is a submissive position. It's a submissive position. Think back to when Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control, right? And, 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 and listen, here's what's interesting. You know, all of those things can be expressed. They can even be achieved for a short period of time without the Spirit. But none of those can yield fruit or have lasting enjoyment apart from the Spirit. So discipline and willpower are simply counterfeit if that's all we're applying to our life. I read an article this week about uh, people making fake eggs in China. And I'm not talking about the little Faberge eggs that you get at the silk market, but actual eggs that they sell for people to eat. And so they, they load them up in vans and then they go to markets and they sell these eggs a little bit cheaper than the other eggs. And this is what they're made of. This is disgusting. I mean, I've, ha I've been to China like 22 times and uh, I have had all sorts of stuff in China. I've not had these fake eggs yet, I don't think. <laughs> so they're made of sodium, starch, and brown algae. So already I was like, man, that... Yak. I mean, that's disgusting. But then I'm thinking to myself, well, what did they make the yolk out of? Because, I mean, they got to got to make it look good, right? So they make the yolk out of resin and wax. That's what they use on surfboards and baseball bats. Can you imagine cutting in to one of those fake eggs, discovering how tasteless and counterfeit it is? Listen, being self-controlled apart from the Spirit is just as tasteless as one of those Chinese eggs. Yeah. The Holy Spirit has to be present. The more submissive we are to the Spirit 
of God, the more self-control and victory we have over our behavior. Last thing is this. Self-control is strengthened in gospel community. It is strengthened in the church. You hear us talk about this all the time. We, we, we say that if you're stuck in the present, you need coaching. If you're stuck in the past, you need counseling. But we all need community. We all need the church. We are designed that way. The church provides accountability and care for us to walk with self-control. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. I love what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says. says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. I love that word encouraging in the Greek. It's perikaleo, which means exhort, admonish, persuade, implore, comfort, console. It's a huge word. It has massive implications for the church. And essentially what it's saying is that I have a responsibility as a disciple to place myself under the care of the church and to engage in care as the church. You want to experience Holy Spirit-driven self-control, then you have to be a part of of the church. Listen, you've heard us say this before. The methods of Christ are just as sacred as the message of Christ. Say it again. The methods of Christ are just as sacred as the message of Christ. God brought his church here. He raised the church up. He wants you to be a part of it. He wants you to engage it at every level, not because, you know, the stat sheet in heaven, they're going, okay, here's who came, here's who gave, all that, because he knows that the church is necessary for you to grow in Christ-likeness. It is necessary for you to experience the comfort that, the, 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 the comfort that God provides when you lose somebody dear to you. When you need a word of encouragement, Maybe when you need a word of correction. Galatians 6.2 says this, Bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of God. Paul's talking to the church at Galatia here. You know, we, take, we actually take that verse out of context all the time. The context is church discipline. Let me talk about it for a second from the standpoint of self-control. You know, it's not saying that we constantly rescue the person without consequences. Again, that's what was happening with Samson and Delilah. There was a codependency taking place there. Anytime you're in a codependent relationship, you will physically, emotionally, and spiritually begin to pay bills that aren't yours to pay. And I'm I'm not just talking about physical bills. But it says, bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of God. Understand the consequences that an irresponsible person is facing is far more painful than the confront of conversation that must be had within the context of the church. Again, the church is designed to encourage, as Hebrews 10, 24. And we, we may not always like what's being said, but it's designed to exhort, admonish, persuade, implore, comfort, and console. And here's also part of the charge of that verse. When it says, bear one another's uh, sin or bear one another's burden. That there's no time frame on that. The church is in it for the long haul. Yeah. Listen, for LBC to be a church full of people who express self control, we must be a people who model walking in the Spirit together. And this happens within the context of the gospel community. Pray with me. Father, there's a lot there in that story. And there's a lot there for us this morning to take heed to. So Father, I would just ask that in these few moments that you would speak clearly to us. I'm also going to assume, Lord, that you've already been speaking as your word has been presented So now, Lord, would you help us respond appropriately? 
that we need to identify and just recognize and, and, and just be accountable to you about some things in our own life, would we have the courage to do that? Would we also recognize that you're a God who rescues us out of our deepest pains and hurt? And no doubt, for some of us this morning, we may feel like we're at the end of our rope. And would you help us taste your grace and mercy this morning? Father, help us respond appropriately to what you've been speaking into us. In Jesus' name, amen.